Early in life, James Madison Leiniger drew scenes that reflected his previous life as an American fighter pilot. His parents said that he began drawing these naval battle scenes with aircrafts overhead, and they noticed that there was very specific details of weaponry and tactics, featuring propeller-driven aircrafts, but like not recent stuff. Like this was all older stuff, all retro. Also, James could name the aircrafts in the pictures. He's like, yeah, these are Wildcats, these are Corsairs. And he was even calling like planes by their names that were more slang use. Like he was like, oh yeah, that's uh, that's that, that's this. I can't say the names, but you get the idea. And the dad was doing research. He's like, oh no, like this, this matches up. Interestingly, James actually signed his drawings James the Third. And when asked like why, he's like, oh no, I'm the third one. Well, when they matched the memories with the historical records and the memories of witnesses, the pilot he had been was identified as one James Houston. Junior. Gideon H. is a Hungarian who, as a boy, apparently remembered a past life as a dark-skinned member of a tropical tribe. It's important, I promise. The first indication of his memories came in the form of art. His mother noticed that when he drew people, he always colored them with a brown crayon. And she's like, well, why don't you use the lighter one, honey, like similar to your own skin? Well, at that point, he was like, no, mom, I lived before in a different country. I'm drawing what I used to look like. And his mother's description was that he would draw a hut with a cone-shaped roof, a peculiar vent for the smoke, something that she'd never really seen before. And in front of the hut, he showed a nude woman in detail. And allegedly, this was his past wife. Gideon described in both words and drawings his primitive tropical life of hunting, using a dugout canoe and not entering rivers or lakes because there was a monster that bit people's legs. We're assuming crocodiles, but hey, you never know, could be a Titan of Bow or something. He demonstrated skills in rowing, tree climbing, and drumming that he had not learned in his current life, as well as a phobia of entering open water. George Neidhart apparently had memories of several past lives jumbled together and astounded his father by recounting his experience losing his head. In 1924, during a bout of depression, Neidhart, now a young man, experienced a coherent series of images that he felt was reliving of a past life in medieval Bavaria. He recounted the sequence in writing and included a sketch of the castle he recalled living in and spent the next couple of years searching for the location and attempting to verify details. With some success, he apparently was able to find like a secret passage that he remembered. In 2012, reincarnation researcher Okaru Masayuki published a paper on the case of a Japanese girl who recalled having been an Indian woman in her previous life. The girl's memories were not sufficiently detailed for the past life to be identified, but the names she recalled were confirmed as typically Indian by Indian associates of the author, as were details of the houses she recalled. She had a birthmark on the center of her forehead, where Hindu women traditionally wear a bindi, and she said herself that it corresponded to the bindi she had worn in her past life. She said, the goddess I met in heaven stamped it on me so I would not forget about my life in India. And she drew female figures often wearing that same bindi. British author Jenny Cockle has described many past life recollections from many past lives. The most detailed was life as an Irish woman, Mary Sutton, who died about 20 years before Jenny's birth, worried about what would become of her eight descendants. Well, Jenny's research led her to reconnect with Sutton's offspring, who accepted her as their mother's reincarnation based on the knowledge she shared with them that only their mother had known. In her younger years, Jenny frequently drew maps showing the layout of the village she remembers as Mary Sutton's home. She writes that when she was younger, she would repeatedly draw rough maps of the village, marking the shops, the main roads, the station, and specifically the home. Now, sometimes other remembered landmarks would appear, but there was a remarkable consistency throughout the years. So later on, she was looking at a map of Ireland to see if a particular location, you know, caught her eye. And she's like, yeah, Malahide, this village north of Dublin. As an adult, she compared her map based on memory to a larger scale one of the area, and uh, turns out they actually matched. The case of Jasmine, a younger girl who appeared to have memories of the first world mass extinction event, was reported by her nursery school teacher, writing under the name of Angel Cat on a past life forum. So Angel Cat recorded her interactions with Jasmine and other witnesses from like October of 2007 to December of 2009. And Jasmine shared many details, which Angel Cat and others verified as accurate. We're talking pilot's attire, hair products, songs that were from that time that weren't really mainstream. In May of 2009, Jasmine's mother reported that when Jasmine heard that the washing machine had broken down, she's like, why not use a mangle? Now this was a hand cranked clothes wringer that was common in till about the 1950s, but the mom didn't know what that meant. Heck, I didn't even know what that meant until today. 
In the thread, Angel Cat claimed to have identified the pilot that Jasmine likely was in her past life, but didn't want to share that detail for privacy reasons, which I totally respect. Marcel was a Dutch boy who had memories of being possibly a soldier, possibly American, who died in battle. So when he was, you know, doodling age, according to his mother, he began repeatedly painting or drawing scenes of a beach filled with military vehicles and weapons. And when she showed these to a renowned philosopher and reincarnation researcher, one Titus Rivas, he's like, yeah, no, that's, that checks. There's something going on here. Boriska Kiprianovich said he lived on Mars before a war broke out and all life on the planet was destroyed and then was reborn here on Earth. Well, his parents claimed that he was able to speak just like months after he was born. He had a profound knowledge of the cosmos and alien civilizations, even though they weren't the ones who introduced him to such topics. He took part in an in-depth interview with Project Camelot back in 2007 when he was like really young and was showing signs of being mature far beyond his age. At the time, the interviewer described him as like earnest and but polite and polite in a way that seemed unusual for a boy of that age. In the interview, our Witness offers his own take on Martian life, saying that folks on Mars can stand over two meters tall, they stop aging at the age of 35, and can breathe carbon dioxide. But apparently a nuclear mass extinction event wiped out much of the civilization, and those who survived moved underground, which is why scientists have never discovered evidence of life on the red planet. When Ryan Hammond, a boy from Oklahoma, was kind of young, he was having these really intense nightmares. Every night he'd wake up screaming for his mom, being like, I used to be somebody else, I used to be somebody else. You've got a crazy imagination, buddy. Like, let's try and find something else. Maybe a monster under the bed or in the closet. Well, as Ryan's insistence on visiting his home continued, his parents were getting concerned. So they went to one Dr. Jim Tucker, a well-known psychiatrist, who was actually able to verify these reincarnation claims. NBC News reported that Ryan's detailed memory suggested that he'd been a Hollywood actor in a past life. Well, in 2015, Ryan was like, look, I can remember every single detail. Quiz me, please. He said his home was in Hollywood. He told stories of meeting with iconic actress Rita Hayworth. He talked about dancing on Broadway, traveling to Paris with his wife, working at an agency, like, but then Cindy, mom, she stumbled upon a book published in 1932 called Mae West, Night After Night on the Golden Age of Hollywood. Well, Ryan pointed to the black and white picture of a man in the book and was like, that's me. Well, turns out this old Hollywood archivist identified the man in the book as Marty Martin. And Ryan was like, yeah, I'm the reincarnation of Marty, who died in 1964. And he verified like a lot of details, stuff that wasn't even on the internet. For our final story today, we're traveling back to the early 1930s, when a woman named Shanti was just learning how to speak. And she began telling her parents the story of her past life in the town of Mathura, which was like 75 miles away from where she had been born in Delhi. She informed her parents that her previous name was Lutti, and she passed away shortly after bearing a son in October of 1925. She spoke often of her husband, a merchant, whose name she refused to reveal until she was close to being a bit older. She eventually revealed that his name was Pandit Karnathan Jobe, sometimes referred to as Keter Nath, a friend of the family. And it got to the point where a friend of the family was like, hey, let's see what's going on here. Let's try and find this guy. So they sent a letter to a merchant with the same name in Mathura, being like, hey, are you this guy? Well, to the friend's surprise, Nath wrote back confirming all the details and let's, and offered to send somebody there to like, you know, get an idea of the situation. So in an effort to test her knowledge, the relative was brought before Shanti first and they were like, yeah, that's your husband. She's like, no, that's my husband's cousin. Well, it kind of shocked everybody, but Nath was there and with the offspring he'd had with Lugdi, they entered the home and Shanti burst into tears when she saw them. She spent a whole week with them before obviously they had to go home and she was saddened by their departure and she pleaded with her parents to let her take a trip to her former home. She's like, look, I can lead everybody directly to my old home and I've got money buried there. That's good persuasion. According to the reports from one of the investigators, Shanti was made to sit in the front seat of the carriage that took them there and they're like, look, let's make sure nobody else influences these directions. Let's see if she can really identify this route perfect. Well, she had zero problem directing the group to what she claimed was her former home. Now, while exploring the house, somebody was like, yo, buried treasure? And she's like, okay, yep, I got it. So she ran upstairs, headed straight to a corner of the room, and she's like, this box is hidden here beneath the floorboard. Well, hubby opened up the flooring and did find a small box, but it was empty. Shanti was like, look, there's money here. And then, and only then, did Nath admit that he had taken the cash after his wife's death. Spooky. Well, that's all, folks. I've been Alexa. See ya. Thank you.